in week six of our series called What Happy Couples Know. And listen, we've gone over the last couple weeks a couple of things. Like in week one, we talked about, listen, listen, every person, it doesn't matter whether you have no faith. It doesn't matter whether you have different faith. It doesn't matter whether you're a follower of Jesus. Listen, everyone comes into a marriage or dating into engagement with this invisible box of hopes, dreams, and desires. And listen, the question we asked in week one is, can anyone really fulfill all of our hopes, dreams, and desires that we have for this relationship? And then week two, we said, listen, everyone has a different box of hope, dreams, and desires. And so when two different people come together with two different boxes of hopes, dreams, and desires, what do we do when they're different? And then week three, we talked about, listen, when we talked about love and we said, listen, love is something we do. We feel love because someone did something that moved our hearts. And then in week four, we kind of turned up the temperature. Week four, we talked about how marital satisfaction is tied directly to sexual satisfaction. We talked about what that looks like in marriage. And then last week, we talked about the differences when it comes to sex between men and women. We covered all that last week. So listen, if you missed any of these messages, you can go onto our YouTube channel. You can subscribe. That's the best way to get them every week. Or you can go to our website and you can catch up. But we're on week six and we're going to cover something that literally, so we're going to cover something today that happens in 100% of all marriage. Listen, this thing happens in every marriage in the past. This thing happens in every marriage that is current. And this thing happens in every marriage that will happen. There's one thing that happens in every marriage at 100%. You want to know what it is? I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's this good word we all love, conflict. <laughs> Y'all look very excited about that, right? You act like none of you have ever had that. No, we never have conflict. Liars, right? 100% of marriages will experience conflict that leads to hurt and disappointment. You know the funny thing about this is, listen, I've been working with people for about 25 years. And in those 25 years, I continue to run into people who are dating or people who are engaged. And they come up to me and they go, we're getting married. And I go, that's great. But usually here's my advice when someone tells me they're getting married. I go, hey, listen, I really want to encourage you. You know, a great marriage is the closest thing to heaven and a bad marriage is the closest thing to double H-E hockey sticks, right? So you really want to have a good marriage? I really, really suggest marriage counseling. And you know what the number one response I get back after I say I suggest marriage counseling uh, to couples who are engaged or dating? This is the number one response. Matter of fact, most people say this to you, we don't need that. We never fight, to which I respond, of course you don't, you're dating. You know why? Because you already know this, and I know this. We all know this. When you're dating, you're on your best behavior. Listen, when you're dating, you don't let him see. When you're dating, you don't let her see. The crazy you, listen, they don't get to see all of you. There's a crazy you that you hide so that they don't know. And listen, eventually when you get married, you can't hide your crazy, my crazy, our crazy forever. It is going to come out. Listen, listen, the most, the, the most amazing people, the kindest people, the nicest people, everyone, no matter how much you try and all of your attention and all of your efforts, even great people sometimes just mess it up. We just get it wrong. Sometimes it's unintentional and sometimes it's, in, it's, it's, it's not. But listen, listen, 100% of marriages are going to experience conflict. Listen, listen, can we be honest? Come on, let's just be honest about what marriage is. Listen, if you're here and you're single or, or you're engaged or you're dating or you're married or you're somewhere where it's complicated, listen, listen, we all know this to be true. Think about it. Listen, here's what marriage is. You take two different people. Think about this. You take two different people and you just stick them together. And then you know what you add on top of taking two different people and you stick them together? Listen, each of them has their own unique faults. So faults. And so you have two different people and then you have people with their own faults, their own unique faults that are different. And then on top of that, they have their own unique family dynamics that they bring to the table that's different. And, and they bring their extended family, whether you want them to bring them or not, they come in. And then so you bring that in and see people are laughing. They already know what I'm talking about. And then listen, then if you get married and you have kids, no wonder we have conflict. Listen, listen, conflict is unavoidable and the conflict will come with hurt and disappointment. So listen, listen, conflict in marriage isn't an if question. Conflict in marriage is a when question. But, but here's something we want to do. Here's what we want to kind of tackle. Here, here's something we want to say. And this is why we call it happy couples. No, listen, happy couples deal differently with the unavoidable. Listen, conflict, hurt, and disappointment are unavoidable in marriage. Uh, the hurt and disappointment of marriage. They just deal with it differently. Because see, here's what we all think. Here's what you and I think. Here's what I used to think. And I bet some of you have thought this. You thought, look how happy those couples are. I bet they never fight. 
I bet they never argue. And here's what we think. Oh, if I could just be like them. Listen, happy couples have conflict. Here's the best. Here's really good news. The problem isn't that your marriage has conflict. Here's why it's not a problem. Because every marriage has conflict. Happy couples just deal with conflict differently. And here's why dealing with conflict in marriage is, listen, look up here. Listen, if you're dating and you're single and you hope to be married sometime, listen, this is so important. Here's why dealing with conflict matters. Because in those moments when you have conflict and there's hurt and disappointment, sometimes we can respond in a moment and create consequences that last a lifetime. You see, in those moments where there's conflict and we experience hurt and disappointment, we can say and do things that we can't go back and unsay and undo. Matter of fact, dealing with conflict directly impacts the quality of our marriages. Now, here's the great news this morning. Since every one of us, de- sm- turn to your neighbor and smile. Go, yep, we all, everyone, yep, we all deal with conflict, right? Like, listen, we're all in the same boat. But here's the great news. Listen, God knew this would be an issue. As a matter of fact, God gives you and I some instructions. Remember what I said the other week? Listen, there's one person that wants your marriage to succeed even more than you do, and it's God, and he addresses this issue of conflict. As a matter of fact, he gives us some overarching principles about conflict and all of our relationships, but they should absolutely apply to the marriage relationship. So so this morning, we paid for uh, our rent. I don't know why they didn't turn the AC on, so I'm dripping and melting up here. So I am going to be brief this morning. But here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to share three brief observations when it comes to conflict and, and how we can kind of what happy couples knew. And here, here's the first one. Listen, here's the first one. Conflict comes from unmet expectations. See, conflict is always from unmet expectations. Think about it. Think about it. Like, like you know, whatever this thing is that you are, you, you're in conflict about, whether it's about money, whether it's about house or the car or the kids or what she won't or will not wear to bed, like all those things, whatever it is, whatever the conflict is, it comes from a different expectations. Why? Listen, you have a picture of what this thing is going to look like, right? And, and then they have a picture of what it's going to look like. And the problem is whatever happened doesn't look like the picture that each of you has. And that's where the conflict happens. You you have a picture, they have a picture, those pictures don't match, and conflict comes from unmet expectations. But here's the problem. When our pictures don't match, right? Like, here's what I thought we were going to do today. Well, here's what I thought we were going to do today. And it looks really different. And so I'm frustrated and you're frustrated. And here's what we try to do is, listen, one of us is right. I'm just glad it's me, right? Like, Oh, you guys caught that, right? Like, I mean, don't you know what we say to our spouse? Like, listen, one of us right. I'm just glad it's me. Why don't you just admit you're wrong? My picture's the right picture, so we should do my picture. And here's the problem is, is that when we have these expectations don't meet your picture, our, my picture, it doesn't meet. Here's what we want to do. We want to make sure our spouse knows that our picture's the right one. And so we usually communicate and talk either verbally or non-verbally to make sure they understand what our picture is so we can make sure our picture happens. But when that happens is we never, ever do this one simple thing, and it's called listening. Matter of fact, God gives us some instruction. He tells us, listen, when conflict happens, here's something you should really do. Matter of fact, we pick it up in Proverbs 18, 2. We're going to put it on the screen. It says, fools. Now, the last time I checked is no one ever wants to be a fool. And by the way, no one ever wants to be a fool in marriage, because if you're a fool in marriage, the wheels are going to come off the bus. So no one wants to be a fool. But it says, fools have no interest in understanding. Fools say, listen, I don't have any, I have no, I have no desire to understand. I have no desire to see what your picture is. I have no desire to understand where you're coming from. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. And if we are really honest, listen, I've, I've really had to work on it. This is a struggle for me because when I see a picture the way I want it and my wife has a different picture and our pictures don't match, I always want to explain why my picture is the right picture. And so I want to do all the talking. I have all the words. But when I do that, what am I? Yes, a fool. I always say, I'm a moron. And it's true. That's why I need Jesus. But when we don't seek to understand and we only want to air our own opinion, then we don't seek to understand. And listen, seeking to understand is so much more important than being understood. Now, one of the reasons that there's a conflict is one of the reasons that we have unmet expectations that create conflict is if we are really honest, come on, come on, guys, gals, Ladies, gentlemen, wives, husbands, listen, come on, come on. One of the main reasons why we have conflict is, if we're really honest, sometimes we have unrealistic expectations, don't we? Come on, come on. Like, 
Just smile. It's hard. Nod your head a little bit. Like, great. We have unrealistic expectations. True, true story. Listen, I was meeting with this one couple. They were struggling in their marriage, and they said, Pastor Matt, will you do marriage counseling? And I said, no, I will meet with you one time. I am not a professional counselor. I know how to do kind of triage, emergency stuff. I'm not a professional counselor, but I will connect with you. I'll meet with you once and then move you to someone who is actually really good at this and can help you. And as I met with them, I said, well, what's the problem? Tell me a little bit about it. And one of the spouses says, well, you know, my spouse, they're, they're really not around them much. And when they are around, they're just always exhausted. And, and I just really want them to be, you know, more engaged at home. And I said, okay. And so I turned to the spouse and I said, hey, you know, do you hear what they're saying? And, and they said, yes, I hear what they're saying. And I said, well, you know, how can you, you know, hear what they're saying? And they said, well, you know, can I share my side? I said, of course, you know, it's an awful thin board with only one side. You can think about that. And so as, as I listened to this other spouse, they said, listen, um, you know, my spouse said, that they wanted to be able to stay home with the kids and they had four kids and, and they had three boys and so it was rambunctious and, and they said, my spouse said that they wanted to stay home and so um, I went and got a second job so that they could afford to stay home and, and then my spouse said they wanted to own their own home and so I got a third job and so I'm working three three jobs you know, because we, have, we own our home home, my spouse wants to stay home, we have a certain lifestyle that, that my spouse wants and I began to say, oh wow, well, like, I could understand if you work three jobs why you're tired when you get home. And I said, is, is it a realistic expectation that, you know, if you want a home, if you want to be able to stay home, if you want to live at a certain standard, uh, that, that your spouse be able to do all these other things? And the reality is, listen, listen, when it's conflict, it almost always comes down to having an expectation that is either unrealistic or unfair. Right? Come on. Let me, let me, I'm going to use some generalities. And these aren't always the case. These don't have to be. But like, let me, let me just get, give you some examples. Right? Like, we'll say something like, gosh, I just wish my wife, you know, when I got home would show me attention. And, and she would be all ready for me and excited to see me. And we could have some alone time, which for guys means sex. Right? And, and remember, we do big people church and little people church. We've talked about it for a couple weeks. You should be used to it. So anyway, the, you know, the, the husband comes home. And that's his expectation. And when she's tired and exhausted and she smells like throw up because she's been handling and the kids all day, you know, it doesn't match his expectation and he gets upset. But the, but the reality is, is here's the picture is she's got a couple kids. One of them's been sick. She's been doing all these things. She works part-time. She puts them on the bus. She picks them up. She makes dinner. She has to do the witching hour herself because you're working overtime. So by the time you get home, she's dead exhausted. Do you have fair expectations? The same thing is goes for sometimes ladies will go, Hey, listen, I wish that they did this, or I wish that they did that. But maybe the situation is, is that, that, that your husband's job, is precarious and maybe they're doing layoffs wherever they're doing and, and he wants to make sure that he doesn't get laid off and so he's working extra hours to provide and, and to do those things. And here's the thing, we often voice our expectations in a vacuum, not in context because conflict is always a result of unmet expectations. And this is why, listen, this is why it's so important. Listen, when, listen, conflict comes from unmet expectations. So you know what you should do is you should talk to each other. I know it's rocket science. It's so new. Like you guys are blown away. You're like, mind blown. We should talk to each other. But listen, 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 listen. Come on, listen here. We bought into a lie. We bought into a lie. And I'm going I'm to put it up on the screen. Listen, listen. We're going to put it up on the screen. Listen, ladies, love will not transform your spouse into a mind reader. They should just know, yes, in the movies. They should just know, yes, in the fairy tales. They should just know, yes, in fiction. But the last time I checked, love does not transform him or her. Guys, if, if you want to communicate something, don't go, I drop hints all the time. I drop hints. Listen, you need to talk. Love will not transform your spouse into a mind reader. Don't go, let's not get each other's gifts. And then go, oh, I hope they secretly get something because they love me so much. Because that will end poorly. He'll just go, oh, there's no one gift. <laughs> Guys, free gift. You don't have to put anything extra in offering. If your spouse ever says, let's not get each other stuff, you go ahead and get something small. I just save you problems, right? Listen, and here's what I discovered. Love will not transform your spouse into a mind reader. And that's why we went to Proverbs 18.2, where it says a fool has no, uh, no concept of understanding and just wants to air their own opinion. That's why we need to have communications, why we need to talk about what is it that you expect? What is it that I expect? And are those expectations fair? Are those expectations realistic? Because conflict always comes from unmet expectations. But guys and gals, do not expect your spouse to go, no, there's nothing wrong. I'm not mad, which in girl language is, I'm really upset. You better keep asking me. 
And guys, if she ever says, go ahead, do what you want, which means go ahead, I dare you. <laughs> Don't do it. And ladies, when a guy says nothing's wrong, it really means nothing's wrong. <laughs> and if you ask a guy, is nothing wrong? He goes, no, nothing's wrong, but could we have sex? That's usually his thought process. Um, and so listen, we just like, listen, there's a little bit of humor. We understand what we're saying, but the reality is, is, is that love doesn't transform anybody into a mind reader. We need to take time to communicate so that we have realistic and fair expectations of each other. Which leads me to observation number two. And this observation actually doesn't come from me. This observation, before I get to it, comes from an author. She's a clinical researcher named Shanti Feldman. Matter of fact, we have one of her books out there. I highly recommend it. She's done a bunch of research. And she said this is a foundational principle. She said there's a couple things that make great marriages great marriages. And she says this is one of the things that we found that make great marriages great marriages all across. It is fundamental. Every great marriage needs this, and we're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this. Love chooses, and I use this word right here, chooses to assume the, love chooses to assume the best. Now, here's what I want to be really careful about, because here, here's what sometimes churches have said. When love chooses to assume the best doesn't mean that you stuff. Love chooses to assume the best doesn't mean that you don't ever communicate to your spouse that you're hurt or that you're disappointed. But here's what happens is when your spouse does, because it's not an if question, remember, it's just a when question. When your spouse does hurt you, when your spouse does disappoint me, when you do have conflict, as a spouse, you know, you should think, my spouse didn't marry me to torture me. My spouse married me because they love you. I am going to choose to assume the best. And here's the reality. Happy couples choose to assume the best of their spouse. And it's always a choice that when we experience hurt or disappointment to choose the worst or the best. And matter of fact, this idea didn't just come from Shanti and the research. This is actually something God told us way back then, and it's all about love. Matter of fact, we find this in 1 Corinthians 13, which is often called the love chapter. It's one of the most read passages in marriage ceremonies, even though it doesn't deal with marriage. It's really about what church people are supposed to look like and love the world, but we'll get to that on a different day. But it's often read at weddings, and I want to share this, this verse because it'll help you and I understand why we should assume the best. Love. And so all these things are what real love looks like. Not, not on fairy tales, not in the romance novels, but here's what love is. Love suffers long and is, what's that word? Kind. Love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love does not flaunt itself. It is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself in property. Love does not seek its own. It is not easily provoked. I mean, I just think about it then in marriage. Like there's, there's so many times it's easy to be provoked. Love is not easily provoked. Thinks no See, when our spouse, when we get conflict, when our spouse hurts and disappoints us, we admit, listen, that really hurt, or hey, that really disappointed. But we need to add something. But I know they, I know they love me. Yes, they disappointed me. Yes, they hurt me. But I know they love me. It thinks no evil, and it goes on to continue to say this. It says, it rejoices. Love rejoices not iniquity. Love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. It means, listen, even though you hurt me, even though you disappointed me, even though we're in conflict, I'm going to believe the best. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Listen, conflict, hurt, and disappointment aren't an if thing. It's a win thing. Ask anybody that's been married more than seven days and they will have experienced disappointment, hurt, and conflict. Because we're human beings. We're flawed. We need Jesus. But when that happens, love means we assume the best. And here's the thing. Here, here's the kicker. When I did the research or read the research that Shanti Feldman had done on this kind of core foundational principle of happy couples that love assumes the best when you're disappointed and when you're hurt, here's the thing that I realized is that it's really hard to do. It's easy to say, but hard to do. Matt, well, I want to assume the best of my spouse, but why is it when I feel hurt, why is it that when I feel disappointed that it's so easy to believe the worst about my spouse that I married, that I held on to? Well, why is that? Well, here's why. I'm going to put it up on the screen, and, and it's, it's this. It's the weight of a past wound often pulls us towards thinking the worst. Can I get an amen? I mean, can, can we be really honest? It's, it's there's wounds in our heart and our soul. For many of us, they've come from a mom or from a dad. That's why we call it mommy and daddy issues. Many of us may have a wound from a past relationship. Let, let me give you an example. 
what I'm talking about from my own life. I married one of the greatest human beings in all the world, my wife. She is beautiful. She is wonderful. She is kind and sweet. She is not perfect. And so there are times that we have conflict. There are times that I feel hurt. There are times that I feel disappointment. The problem is I know, like in my mind, I know that my wife is a good person. I know that she's loved me. As one friend says, I know she's on my side. The problem is, even though I intellectually know that, my, my dad my dad rejected me. My dad abandoned me. He took me to the police station and said, I hope this is what you want. My mom committed suicide. So I have abandonment and rejection issues. So every time my wife hurts me or every time my wife disappoints me, I want to assume the best. The problem is I have this wound that pulls me towards thinking the worst. And I want to ask you a question. Is there an issue from growing up from your mom or your dad? Is there an issue from a previous marriage? Is there an issue from a previous relationship? Is there a wound that is weighting your current relationship down? Is there a wound that is ruining your relationship? Because every time you experience conflict, every time you experience rejection or hurt, you immediately assume the worst because this wound causes you to assume the worst. And here's why assuming the worst is so dangerous. I'm going to put it up on the screen. This is so important. Listen, if you don't hear anything, here's why assuming the worst is so hard. Thinking the worst leads to protect or punish mode. See, when we believe the worst about our spouse, we go, oh, no, 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 you didn't, right? And so if we believe the worst that our spouse, when, they, when we got conflict and, and they hurt me and they disappointed me, we either go into protect or punish mode, which means, listen, I'm not going to be hurt again. Yep, you hurt me this time, but I'm going to put my walls up and you will not hurt me. How like, how does a marriage survive? How is a marriage healthy? How is a marriage good? How is there intimacy? How is anything good in marriage when you assume the worst and you decide, I'm going to put my walls up? Or you decide you're going to punish him or her. Well, I'm not going to talk to her. I'm not going to give her compliments. I'm not going to give her affection. I'm going to withhold sex. I'm not going to give him compliments. I mean, when we think the worst of our spouse, we go into protect or punish mode. It's called fight or fight. That's what happens when we assume the worst. Something in our brain decides, listen, I am either going to shut down or I'm just going to unloose the rockets. We go into protection and punish mode. And that is horrible. That will destroy a marriage. That's why she says in all the research, that's why God tells us to love, to think no evil, to bear all things, to believe all things, to assume the best, to not easily be provoked. Because really the truth is the person, listen, there are a few people out there. I get it. There's some broken people. I used to be a broken person that if you married them, that you, you should get some counseling because maybe they are hurtful. But for 95% of people, they, they married you. They loved you. They don't want to hurt you. They are on your side. You should assume the best. The problem is you have a wound. I have a wound. We have a wound. And unless you deal with that wound, you will continue to assume and think the worst. And you will continue to go into protect and punish mode. And you will destroy the very thing that you love. That's why love assumes the best. And you know, here's the most amazing thing. This is exactly what God does. I mean, here's what Jesus said on the cross as they were nailing him to the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The scripture tells us that when we were God's enemy, Christ died. The very thing that you and I were doing the worst that offended God the most, God still loved us. Because God loves differently. God has a kind of love that just is beyond description. And I want to put it this way, and it goes something like this. Love chooses. See, listen, I just want to be real honest. Love is not just an emotion. Feeling loved is something that happens to you, but love is a choice. And so love chooses to see someone as they could be, not as they are in the moment. I heard an old wise preacher one time say, I'm going to give you grace today because I'm going to need it tomorrow. And see, this is what happy couples know. They choose to see their spouse as they could be, not as they are in the moment. Yes, that hurt. Yes, that, that caused disappointment. Yes, that wasn't fair. Or yes, that just really hurts. But I'm going to assume the best of you. I'm going to believe that you're on my side. And I am not going to go into protect mode. I am not going to go into punish mode. I am going to choose to keep my heart soft and open. And I want to work on a relationship. I choose to see the you that you could be just the way God chose to see the me that I could be, even in my worst moment. That's what the kind of love of God that's 
dwells in the hearts of those who follow Jesus can transform a marriage. Love chooses to see someone as they could be, not as they are. That's why love always assumes the best. That's why it's a foundational principle. Which leads to what can we actually do in marriage? Like, what, how does this practically apply in every day? And so it leads to a third observation, and it's this. Adults. Uh, whenever, this is going to be, you know, at South Point, we always have buckle up moments. Bing, buckle up, because you're not going to like what I'm going to say. Listen, can we just be adults? Listen, I've sat in marriage counseling. I've heard of marriage stories. And I just go, can, can, can we just grow up, people? Like, we're not 12. We're not 6. We're not 5. Adults kindly and carefully share. They go, hey, listen, that really hurt my feeling. And say, I'm sorry. And I, listen, I can't tell you the number of people that go, listen, I'm just a straight shooter. I just tell it like it is. And I go, you know what? You don't tell your boss like it is. You know, you don't tell the judge like it is when you're there getting your ticket. Like, I mean, you, you, you want to be able to use that as an excuse to just to say whatever you want, to not have to give any energy or effort to be kind and careful. And to be honest with you, I was like that for a part of my marriage where, you know, I just thought being brutally honest and just saying what I felt was good. And then I just realized, you know what, I give so much energy to being careful with the words with the people that I work with, careful with the words of the people that I'm a, a part of a church because I love Jesus. And then I would go home and not give that same dignity and respect to my own wife and kids, and it is wrong. Adults, kindly and carefully. Adults, kindly and carefully share. Matter of fact, and they say, I'm sorry. Listen, here's what Jesus says. We're going to put it up on the screen. These are the words of Jesus. So if you want to know, like, should you actually share? And you don't have to share everything, but there are some things that you should share. Here's what Jesus says. In Matthew 18, 15, Jesus says, if another believer sins against you, go, what's that word? Hey, man, just church, if y'all could get a hold of that, we, we'd be, the church would be so much better. Oh, I'm going to share it in a prayer request. I'm going to share it on Facebook or Instagram. Right? If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Listen, when your spouse and you are in conflict and there's hurt and disappointment, the first person to know isn't your mom or your dad. It's them. Listen, when your spouse hurts you and there's conflict and there's disappointment hurt, the first people should, to know shouldn't be your coworkers or your friends down at the local area or at the gym or your girlfriend or your, you know, your boyfriends or your friends or your home, whatever. Go privately and point it out. It, you shouldn't put your stuff out on Facebook, people. Like if your spouse has done something, and there's an old saying, don't sweat the small stuff and everything small st stuff. And that's not true. There is small stuff in our relationships that you go, I'm just going to let that go. Love covers a multitude of sins. I'm just going to let that one slide. But sometimes when we're hurt on the inside and something deeply isn't right, that's when we need to kindly say to our spouse, you know, we just need to sit down and talk. And, and I really want to encourage you, never do it after 9 o'clock. Don't do it when you're hungry. Don't do it when you're angry. Don't do it when you're lonely. And don't do it when you're tired. It's called halt. If you're going to have a difficult conversation, do it when they have energy, you have energy. There's some calmness. If you need to step away for a second, but figure out how to be an adult and say it kindly. This hurt. This makes me feel rejected. This makes me feel unloved. This makes me feel used. This makes me feel like you're not my partner. You know, just, just be honest. Which leads to the last part. And, and I don't understand this, and, and, and this is something that I just learned. I don't know where I learned it. Maybe it was God's grace. But listen, when we get it wrong, just say you're s sorry. Like, can we just try that? Let's just try saying I'm sorry. One, two, three, I'm sorry. See, you didn't die. See how easy it was? Listen, listen, sometimes we may not mean to hurt someone, but it doesn't mean that they didn't get hurt. And so we need to be able to say, I'm sorry. And listen, Jesus tells us that we should be people who make it right and who apologize. As a matter of fact, this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, listen, suppose you're offering a gift to the altar. What he's saying is, suppose you're going to church or you're trying to talk to God or you're praying or you're trying to like go, hey, God, I want to be right this way. And you remember that your brother, your sister, and by the way, your spouse should be on the top of the list there, has something against you. You're in conflict. There's heard of disappointment. He says this is Jesus' own words. We're going to go to the next slide. He says, leave your gift in front of the altar. He says, listen, don't play church. D don't talk to God. Don't, don't do this. If you're not right this way, don't try to be right this way. Get right this way with the people that you know and the relationship you are. Then you can get right this way. He says, leave your gift in front of the altar. First, that means you have to do something. Well, I'm not going to apologize. I'm going to make them apologize first. Well, then just you have two people waiting. Remember again, adult, like, you know, just, just, just be adults. We can just go 
and make peace with them. Then come back and offer your gift. And I want to say something about apologies because I used to give really bad apologies. I used to give an apology like this. Well, I'm sorry you're hurt if what I said <laughs> hurt your feelings. Huh, just should be so weak, but I guess I'm sorry. Like that is not an apology, people. I guess I'm wrong. Okay, you know, like that is an apology. First, you know what an apology includes? An apology includes acceptance. Apology says, listen, I have a responsibility in this relationship, in this marriage. An apology means I have some responsibility for the way that I behave, my actions, my words, my thoughts. I'm going to take responsibility for my part. And if it's only 1%, I'm going to take responsibility for my 1%. So an apology means, yep, I'm a part of the problem, but I want to be part of the solution. The second part of apology isn't just like, I'm sorry. It also says, it asks, what can I do to make this right? Part of apology goes, I obviously hurt you. I obviously disappointed. How can we make this right? Because I want to make sure that we're good. It asks, how can I make this right? And the third part of the apology is, is it alters our behavior. Listen, listen, we all have habits that are bad. We all have things in our life that we wish we were better, natural tendencies like we, that we need to improve. But listen, you can't say you're sorry, sorry over and over if you don't try to alter or change the behavior that creates hurt. So a true apology includes accepting responsibility. I'm a part of it. It also says, listen, how can I make this right? It asks, how can I make it right? And then lastly, it seeks to alter the behavior so that it doesn't create continued hurt. Because here's what I've discovered as we land this page. Is that, listen, real people in the real world with real lives and real marriages are going to experience conflict. If you want a marriage without any conflict, don't get married. <laughs> like that is the solution to a conflict-free marriage is don't be married. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when. And so here's my question. How will you deal with conflict? I mean, God's given you and I some pretty good instructions. Are we seeking to understand? Are we assuming the best? Are we dealing with our wound so that when we experience hurt, pain, and disappointment, we're not dragged to always thinking the worst so that we go into protect and punish mode? Do we honestly share when, when it's a significant thing, when we feel really hurt or disappointed, do we, do we share it as an adult, kindly, gracious way? And when we get it wrong, do we just look our spouse in the eye and go, I'm sorry, it was me. I have some things that can explain it, but it doesn't excuse it. Because here's what happy couples know. Conflict's going to happen. They're just going to deal with it differently. And God gives us those things so that you and I can succeed in marriage. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. This is what I love about you. This is what I love about the Bible. It's what I love about Jesus is that you're a true teller. And that you help us to realize that conflict's going to happen, that there is going to be hurt and pain and disappointment. But thank you for showing us how to If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.